This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Debbie Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. The news about the seventh-year cicadas has been all over the news lately, but how will that affect us here in Mississippi? Dr. Richard Brown from the Entomology Museum at Mississippi State will join us this morning to talk about the cicadas here in our state. Also, fireflies are everywhere, so Libby Hartfield and Claire Graves will share tips on how you can see the nightly light show. And as always, Dr. Major is ready for pet questions, although he's running a little bit late this morning and hasn't joined us, but hopefully he will throughout the hour. You can join our conversation this morning with your creature and pet questions. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Email animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning. Yes, doing great. Thought we'd start out. We've got a couple of bird-related emails, and this first one says, I've had bluebirds nest in my birdhouse for the last two seasons. I cleaned it out last February, but now they just look in and aren't nesting. Any ideas why? Oh, um, well... We lost our bluebirds during the big storm when it was so cold, what do you call it, the polar vortex. Mm. So we, um, our birds had started their nest, and then they died during that storm. And so, of course, and none others came to fill the nest. It's possible that he had a male looking in, and the male has not found a mate yet, or it's possible that they, of course, found another box that they liked better this year or a, a natural cavity. Uh, that's kind of all I've got to give him right now. Sorry, I hope that uh, it's getting a little late for them to start nesting, but it's it's not impossible. So he really might. Uh, do you know where he lives? Um, How far north in the state? Not sure. It doesn't, doesn't have an animal or a location. Say, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. depending no, on how far north he is in the state. Uh-huh. He, he does say he's in uh, Hernando. Oh, okay, yeah. So he might still still get a nesting pair but sometimes one you know a single male or will look in the boxes and he hasn't found a mate yet so it's not going to do him any good to move in if he doesn't get a a mate uh is there anything that they might do to the box to try to make it more attractive to birds they can check online and get all those regulations there's a certain height and i can't remember exactly what that is and, you know, it's better if it faces a certain direction. And it needs to be in an open area where the birds can swoop around. You know, they're fly-catching kind of um, birds, so they they want to be able to swoop around and catch their insects. So they, like on the edge of a field or a, a park kind of area, they like an open spot. They don't, they don't want to have um, tree limbs all around their birdhouse. All right, here's another one that says, Monday I saw a swallowtail kite on Highway 18 near the Rankin-Smith County line. Uh, they're not common in this area, are they? Thanks for a wonderful well, show. Uh, remember, we yeah, we had a program about that not too long ago, and uh, they, uh, they're they they're not common, no, but they are uh, being seen more and more along the Pearl River. The Pascagoula has always had a good population for uh, many years now, and they're getting to be seen more and more. And, um, oh, I've seen them on the Pearl through the years. I mean, as long as the year we moved into the museum in nineteen in um, 2099, I remember seeing a group that first day that I was in my office at that building. So they've, you know, they've been around for 20 years, but it's not a common sighting by any means. He should be really pleased. One of our listeners sent me an email of a picture of once that they also saw. Uh, remind everybody what a swallowtail kite is. Well, it's a, a, a beautiful bird of prey and it's a, uh, you know, smaller than most of the hawks we see probably. And um, it has a beautiful forked tail that um just gives it kind of a magical because the you know each side of the fork tail are long 
and uh, some people call them an angel bird. They have they have a very beautiful profile, and they um, a, a lot of gymnastic kind of flying. So especially if you can, uh, if you're lucky enough to watch them going after, actually they would be going after cicadas if this was a <laughs> year for us to have the emergence. So uh, it's a fun bird to watch swoop around and dance in the air. All right, and we're going to be talking about cicadas throughout the hour. Also, we're going to be continuing our discussion about fireflies. And you know, I know, Libby, that you've been excited about being able to see the, the nightly uh, uh, light shows in your area. Uh, but what else are you seeing in your yard these days? Let's see. Uh, I've got more hummingbirds this time of year than I usually do. And i uh, draining the feeders almost every day and i've got flowers blooming so they're also getting a lot of natural nectar got a perula nest and a perula nest and the crested flycatchers didn't use our nesting box but we have two pair we think so we're looking for where they might be nesting and we're watchers, watching summer tanagers and orchard orioles both of which are eating in our tulip poplar tree and in our mulberries. So we've had fun with all of those birds. And then we're up late every night watching fireflies. So it's pretty, it's a a great time of year for us. My favorite, I guess my favorite season is firefly season. (laughs) By the way, big thanks to everyone who's been sending in pictures recently. We love to get uh, the, your snapshots of what you're seeing out there uh, when you're enjoying the great outdoors in Mississippi. Uh, sometimes if you want to just share it with us or if you're looking for an identification, uh, you can uh, send it to animals at mpbonline.org. And if you do need some uh, ID help, uh, Libby has some contacts there still at the museum. So we try to help you find out uh, if she can't uh, figure it out. We will try to help you find out what, what you've been seeing uh, with your smartphones when you are out um, in the, uh, like I say, enjoying uh, nature. So I think we want to go ahead and maybe take a break early on. So, yeah, it is time for our first break of the hour. When we return, we'll uh, welcome back to the show Dr. Richard Brown. He's the former director of the Mississippi Entomology Museum at Mississippi State. He'll let us know if Mississippi should be expecting cicadas in the summer. So stay tuned. If you want to join today's show, call in with your questions and comments. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 Seven four six four. Email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Thanks for joining us. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Libby Hartfield. Dr. Troy Major is scheduled to join us this morning, but we're having a little bit of trouble connecting with him, so we'll put uh, pet questions on hold temporarily. But you can still join the conversation with a question or comment. The phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Joining us now is uh, Dr. Richard Brown, former director of the Entomology Museum at Mississippi State. Uh, Dr. Brown, thanks for joining us. The big question on a lot of people's mind is, will we have cicadas emerging this year in Mississippi? Well, thanks for having me on. Yes, indeed, we'll have cicadas emerging. But we have two groups of cicadas. The one we've been hearing about in the news up north is the periodical cicada which there emerges every 17 years, we have 13-year cicadas. And they won't, we won't see those again until another four years, uh, at least. But uh, we will have the annual or dog day cicadas emerging, but they're in small numbers, and we'll hear them in the summer. So the one that's taking place this year and the ones here in Mississippi are on kind of completely different uh, cycles. Well, both the, the species in the north as well as those here uh, include the annual cicada, and then those are different from the periodical 17-year and 13-year. Uh, why do the periodical cicadas emerge in such large numbers? 
Well, people have <coughs> studied this and consider it to be one way for getting around predators. By emerging in large numbers, they overwhelm the predator birds, and um, a lot of them are eaten, but there's still some left over. And so that's one of the main ideas is that it they they overwhelm the predators and some get through to mate and reproduce. So I think a lot of people, when they think of cicadas, think of that song, that l- loud uh, noise that they make. Uh, wh- why why are they doing that? The each kind of cicada, and we've got here in Mississippi about twenty different kinds of cicada species, and each one has a different song. And they use this sound, this song, to attract their mates. So it's for courtship. And that's why it's important that the sound is heard by the opposite sex, the male making the sound. And they make the sound like uh, with these sheets on their abdomen. It's like if you take a piece of sheet metal and wave it, it'll make a a sound. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's the same way they make their sound, by buckling this membrane on their abdomen. And it can be quite loud um, when they, when they're, they're among the loudest of the insects. Um, so if they're in these big groups, these big broods, how does the female know which male they want to mate with? Um, it depends on how close the male is to the female, but the females will recognize the sound of their own species, the male of their species. Now, when we have the emergence, and what people don't always realize is that the ones emerging in the north this year actually include more than one species. Here in the south, we have up to four species, and they all come out together. So you may hear two or three different songs at the same time, and it doesn't matter. You're, if you're a female, you're going to go to the sound made by the male of your own species. And so that they, they find each other by the sound. Uh, we've got a caller on the line. Our friend John Davis wants to talk about cicadas this morning. John, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Okay. Dr. Brown, I very fondly recall a visit to the Splendid Museum you, yes. you directed a few years ago. I recall. Gorgeous asset for the state. Well, I have two questions. Uh, The first, the fact that the the periodical cicadas are restricted to North America, could it have anything to do with uh, evolutionary consequences of the glacial periods? And the second question, these... uh, creatures are an enormous feast for all sorts of wildlife. Have they ever been used as a human protein source, and uh, are there recipes? <laughs> well, thanks, uh, jo- John, for those questions. Well, these cicadas have preceded our, our glacial, uh, uh, The we've had four periods of glaciation, and these cicadas have been around before that. They also, the glaciers also affected Europe and Asia, and so we're the only ones that have the periodical cicadas, and uh, that's been of interest to many researchers And how did they evolve here and not elsewhere. And as far as there being a source of protein, um, they are indeed... Many insects have the right kind of fat and lots of protein and can be nutritious. And we're one of the few cultures in the world <clears throat> and that uh, do not eat insects as part of our diet. In South America, in Asia, other places, insects are often consumed. Now, I've eaten cicadas and uh, found them just delicious. Uh, so how would, how would you compare or what would you compare the taste of uh, cicadas to? Anything? Well, one of the things when I've seen news reports, they're catching the adult cicada that is hard. It's like eating a shrimp with the shell still on. And the way to, to eat the cicadas is to collect them at night when they're emerging. They're pure white. They shed their outer skin, their hard skin, and they also shed their gut, which is part of their ectoskeleton. 
And so I would go out and collect them in a pan and just deep fry them. They tasted like an almond-flavored shrimp, very tasty. My sons at the time, I had to say, no more. You can't have any more. <laughs> you know, I think it's one of those things where if you told people what you're serving, they would go, ooh, I don't want that. But I think if you served it first and then told them later what it was, <laughs> they might uh, actually have enjoyed it. Uh, I think some people use the term cicada and locust interchangeably. Is that correct? Well, yes. In certain parts of the country, they're referred to as locusts, and this has a historical basis. When the early pilgrims and others came over to North America, they encountered the 17-year cicada in large numbers, and um, they said, well, this is a plague, just like the biblical plague of locusts. And so they use the biblical word of locust, which is actually a grasshopper, to apply to these hordes of cicadas, not knowing that it was a completely different kind of insect. We're visiting on Creature Comforts with Dr. Richard Brown, talking about cicadas this morning. A little later on, we'll expand our uh, conversation to fireflies. We've got some open phone lines if you have a question for our guest this morning. Dr. Majors joined us, so pet questions as well. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring So we do have a pet question on the line, and Stephanie has been patiently holding on for us. Stephanie, it's your turn. Go ahead, please. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for taking my call. Go ahead. Um, I have a Yorkie. She's about one year old, so she's still a puppy. And she is just the sweetest, most shy thing in the world. But she has started to, um, so like, just a very low growl maybe at, like, dogs or um, just other people, and I think she just is very timid, and I want to make sure she's properly socialized so that she doesn't have aggression issues when she gets bigger. So any recommendations? It's a great question, and it does happen. Uh, has she ever tried to bite anybody? No. Okay. She is the biggest scaredy cat. Okay. And this may be a def- defensive mechanism on her part, certainly, to uh, let people know, hey, I'm not excited about seeing you. I would suggest uh, she's small. What is she, like yeah. five, six, five, five pounds? Four pounds, yeah. yeah. I would suggest taking her around to places that would allow, uh, would allow dogs, uh, such as a pet shop, uh, groomer, uh, some restaurants will, but just try to socialize her as much as possible. Uh, and have people, you know, certainly be gentle. If, will she let somebody take her from you? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, pick her up and, and take her and pet her. I think it's a matter right now of, of really socialization and trying to get her out as much as possible. Okay. Uh, so she learns we, that other people aren't dangerous. Exactly. And I have seen some Yorkies, and they're very rare, that will literally uh, – bite, but uh, I think the main thing now is to get her out and uh, and get her out of the house and get her out. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think that'll work. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks uh, Stephanie, for your call. Um, let's uh, stay on the phone lines here for just a moment. Why don't we invite uh, Lucy, who has called in from uh, Jackson this morning. Lucy, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. I have a question. I am concerned about mosquito truck sprayers that are spraying my neighborhood and I'm wondering if those are going to affect the cicadas and fireflies and moths and other insects that are active during that time. And I can take my answer off the air. Also, I'm wondering if there's anything that I can do about it to, to prevent that from happening since they're not very effective for mosquito control. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Dr. Brown, any thoughts? Um, the ultra-low volume fogs that are put out for mosquitoes, um, so far as known, does not have a big impact on cicadas. Um, although if it's going in front of your yard, it, you may it may affect insects in your yard. And in urban areas, mosquitoes still remain a big problem, and um, there's more impact from mosquitoes in terms of illness than any other group of insects. If I had a choice of 
fogging or not fogging. If I lived in an area with lots of mosquitoes, I would welcome a, you know, a, an application of a fog to reduce the number of mosquitoes. But then you may live in an area where they're not a problem. In that case, you should meet with the county health department or whoever's involved with the fogging and say, can can this be reduced? We don't have a mosquito problem in our area. And there's no reason to fog if you don't have a mosquito problem. All right. Uh, thanks for that call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Uh, Dr. Brad, talk a little bit about the life cycle of the cicadas. What are they doing when they're underground before they emerge? And are they kind of under our feet just waiting for their time to, to come out? Well, yes. Um, now, the cicadas, as adults, the female, will lay eggs in the twigs of trees. And you can see the impact because there will be flagging. The very tip end, a couple of feet end of the branch, will turn you know, yellow leaves and loose leaves. When the eggs hatch, those little tiny uh, nymphs drop to the ground and dig in. They have front legs just like shovels to dig through the soil. And they'll go down into the soil and tap into the roots of trees, the roots and rootlets. And they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts. And they stick those in and take the sap from the flo- the xylem from the tree root, and that's what they live on for, in our area, 13 years. Um, They're not known to have a harmful effect on trees, and I know where I have them around my pond bank, I've seen no impact of the feeding, even though there may be thousands in the soil uh, feeding on the roots of these trees. Now, obviously, if we cut the trees down, they're not going to have the food, and that population will die out. Um, So they will continue feeding under the ground and go through moats to increase their size until that soil temperature reaches about 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's a trigger in their 13th year to move up to the top of the ground and crawl up on vegetation and and uh, shed their skin and become adults. And then as adults, their main purpose is to mate to get the next generation of cicadas? Their main purpose is to mate and feed birds. <laughs> I shouldn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> they, their main purpose is to mate. And <laughs> carry on. Um, I, I might add, or maybe feed some people, too. <laughs> That's right. After you describe that so well, I think we might have some people wanting to try uh, the the deep fried cicadas this time around. Well, my son did ask me if he could take some to school, and I said, "No, Daniel, I'm sorry, you can't take any to school." <laughs> Libby, you wanted to to chime in here. Go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just going to add that that all the small mammals like to eat them too. Flying squirrels absolutely love them. It's like. Uh, turkey dinner i guess for a flying squirrel we 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 were rehabbing flying squirrels at one time and oh cicadas were just the the prime thing and so i imagine squirrels and probably anything that can get in is going to eat a cicada this is creature comforts let's get one call in before our next break it's our friend sue who's called in from beaumont good morning sue you're on the air with us good morning i I saw a picture on facebook of of a tree with tree snakes had, they had crawled up this tree, were patiently waiting for the cicadas to emerge, and snakes love them too. They said they would go up there and eat eat the uh, <gasps> nymphs or whatever. So I thought that was interesting. Even snakes like them. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. That's great. Yes. <laughs> Good to hear from you, Sue. Thanks for the call. And like I said, with all these creatures that like, I I don't know. I'm almost considering uh, trying to, to to try some deep fried ones myself. Who knows? Um, be adventuresome and and, and try something. Uh, new. But Troy, Troy, if you're a chef, you might want to saute them and add in a few uh, spices and things. I just did it quick and dirty, but I, they were delicious. <laughs> <deep fried. laughs> it is time for another break on Creature Comforts. When we come back, we will continue our conversation with Dr. Brown and also talk about fireflies with our good friend of the show, Claire Graves. Dr. Major here, ready to take some pet questions. Libby wants to know about your latest brushes with nature. So stay tuned. Call with questions and comments. Our phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 
888-789-7464. Email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. Kevin Farrell here with Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science and Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. To join the conversation, call us at 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Let's uh, head back to the phones. We're going to invite Norman on the line, calling in from Holly Springs. You're on the air with us, Norman. Go ahead. Well, I'm just trying to find out what this thing is called uh, extension service. Does it emanate from... Mississippi State University in Starkville uh, to help us understand if we think we have a animal uh, that has made its home in our hot home in our attic or something and we want to educate ourselves what is the extension service how does that work how well, do you contact them okay thanks for the question um, the Cooperative Extension Service was formed in the early 1900s, um, and it is funded by the state to respond to problems originally that farmers and producers had with agriculture. So their main focus in the past has been agricultural uh, problems. But in more recent years, there are also urban problems with with many insects, termites, and other things. So each county has a, um, a county extension agent, and in some cases that person may cover two counties. There's uh, extension service available to everyone throughout the state. And the their number should be found in the phone book under the county uh, listings. And you can give them a call, or if you have access to the Internet, contact them online to um, post your question or problem, and then they can either refer you to someone else who does animal control or give you advice on how to deal with it. All right, uh, Norman, thanks for that call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Uh, Why don't we stay on the phone lines here for just a moment. Next, let's invite... Alvin, who's called in from Columbus. Alvin, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. My question is, uh, are shed flies in some regions, I mean, yeah, shed flies, that what they refer to cicadas as? Because I was in um, Clinton, Iowa, I think it was in 94. You know, I didn't think about it then, but it must have been a blooming of those things. And it was so bad, they had to bring the snow plows out scrape the streets because I guess cars crushing them, they were having an accident. And I was on the train and re- visibility was reduced to about 50 feet. And it was in the middle of the day there were so many of those things. It were like biblical proportions of those things. I mean, they were everywhere. That's my question. I'll listen to your response on the radio. Alright, uh, Alvin. So, Dr. Brown, have you ever heard them referred to as shed flies? No, I have not. Uh, now, we do have mayflies that emerge in large numbers to the point that they've had to, you know, clean the bridges. Cars couldn't travel across. And I'm wondering if that might be another name for mayflies mm-hmm. that along the Mississippi River, especially, and other large streams, um, they can emerge by the millions and even be picked up by the weather radar. You can see them on the radar in their clouds because they number they can number in the millions. And that's the only thing I could think of that would cause such a, a response in bringing out plows would be mayflies. But I don't know shed flies. All right. Uh, Dr. Major, do you have uh, any cicadas in your insect collection? 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I've got some. I was going to mention one thing that happened uh, years ago in the 80s, and uh, it was not cicadas, but it was the giant water bugs. We had a bloom or a hatch out of those, and cats were eating them. Uh, they were everywhere, and in, in numbers that would uh, compare to the cicadas. There was a pond close by, but there, you know, the giant water bug is pretty awesome looking. But yes, I do have cicadas in my collection. All right. Uh, so, Doctor Brown, when they emerge, do they usually then hang out in trees looking for their mates? Where Where would we find them once they emerge from the ground? <laughs> Once they emerge, it takes them up a couple of days, a few days, to mature to being uh, able to reproduce. And they they hang out, and they can be very cryptic with their their uh, membranous wings that have sort of blinds on them that break up the pattern. And so on the bark of a tree or on a branch, they can be very difficult to see to a predator. And so they'll hang out until it's time to, to mate, and after that, then they can hang around for a few, still live for several days um, before eventually dying. Um, they also have, in addition to predators, they have um, a fungus disease, and it eats away their abdomen, and I have seen live cicadas flying around without an abdomen because of this fungus. That's an interesting sight. <laughs> and uh, Libby just referred me to uh, uh, some research, and I've read this on the Internet as well, that this fungus has some drugs in it that uh, similar to that has psilocybin, which is the same thing found in the so-called magic mushroom. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, we're going to invite another guest on the show, uh, someone that's been on the show with us before. It's Claire Graves. Claire, thanks for joining us. If you would, uh, talk about the Firefly Tour that's happening at the Mississippi Craft Center, although I believe it's sold out for this year. Good morning, y'all. I'm so excited to get to share about our Firefly Tours. You're right. They're sold out this year. We sold over 400 tickets, and these guests are going to get to come and have some guided Firefly Tours to see our Snappy Sync Fireflies this year. So uh, what makes the Craft Center an ideal location for these tours? The Craft Center has a great habitat for Snappy Sink fireflies right behind there, back behind the boardwalk along the Natchez Trace Parkway. So undisturbed wooded area with um, some space for the fireflies to get out and move, not too thick. Um, a great place for people to be able to see them. The other thing, though, that makes it an ideal place is the great partners we have. So the Craft Center has been a really incredible partner they understand that this is a, a really neat draw, something really special we have. And the National Park Service has really welcomed this event, and they're sending a ranger this year to help talk about the park as well. Talk about uh, some of the reactions. I know, uh, I think, remember that you did this last year. Was that for the first time? What are, what are people reacting when they, when they see these light shows? Yeah, last year was our first year to do public tours, and we had... About 170 people come out and see the Snappy Sink fireflies there. Uh, we always get a wide range of reactions, but I think the most common reaction is that people can't believe they have never seen these before. But Snappy Sinks come out for just a few weeks during the year, and if you're not in the right place at the right time, they're easy to miss. So people really get excited about them. It's like uh, seeing twinkle lights, Christmas twinkle lights out there all synced up. And so people talk about it being a, a fairyland or something that – they never thought they'd get to see. Uh, they, they, people think they have to go to the Smokies to see synchronous fireflies, but we have them right here in Mississippi. So uh, what needs to be done to make sure that uh, the folks can enjoy the fireflies, but again, uh, still respect nature? Yeah, so that's something that we're really interested in at this site. So this is a really accessible site, and so it's something that a lot of people like to come out and, and see. But people can hurt the habitat for fireflies, and if we do that, then we won't have them anymore. And so we take a lot of steps to try to preserve the habitat, preserve uh, the fireflies' ability to do their thing. So uh, we encourage people to use as little light as possible when they come out, and we require them to have red covers over their flashlights because that doesn't impact the fireflies as much. Um, people have to put their bug spray on somewhere else. The bug spray will hurt the fireflies. And we also limit the number of people. So we have small tours and guided tours to help people stay on the right track and 
and really learn about the fireflies. And we do a lot of education. So helping people know not just how they can protect fireflies at this location, but how can they protect fireflies in their home area, uh, wherever they may be from. Uh, Dr. Brown, I guess fireflies are similar to cicadas in that they spend some of their life underground and then come out primarily to mate. Is that correct? Well, the fireflies have larvae of the immature form that crawl around on the ground, and they can crawl up plants. Um, I remember several years ago when we had a rain, it quit raining, and I walked out of my house. I had a gravel driveway of about 50 yards, and I thought I could see stars reflected on water on the ground, and then I noticed they were moving. I walked out, and lo and behold, they were the larvae of fireflies, and the tail end was glowing. And it was a constant glow. It wasn't the on and off like the adults have. So the larvae crawling on the ground can have this continuous light. Now, in the adults, the light is for mating, for reproduction, for courtship. But the larvae have it, and I've always wondered why, and I've wondered if maybe that's to attract food, if they have a light at the tail end to attract food. But then they will, they're predators. They feed on other insects, and then when they... Uh, reach maturity, they will change to the pupa and then into the adult. Now, cicadas don't have a pupal stage, just the egg and the nymph and the adult. Um, Claire, are you having an event at the uh, the Clinton Nature Center this year? So Libby and Paul are leading some tours there, um, and they could probably speak to that, but that's a really great event for people who um, weren't able to get tickets this year for the Craft Center event. That's a wonderful time. I've attended in previous years. I don't know, Libby, if you want to speak to that some more. Yeah, and Claire, if you want to come help us next Wednesday, we would love for you to. <laughs> and that's May the 26th at 8.30 on that Wednesday night. And uh, they've had a good population out there at the Clinton Nature Center for a while. And it's just a whole lot of fun and uh, always a lot of young people, a lot of kids. And we kind of have the same rules as you do. Don't shine your lights and be very careful with um, uh, your bug spray and your flashlight because that's two things that fireflies don't like. One of the fun things about fireflies with um, groups of children is that they don't hear you. So, you know, if you sometimes we're wildlife watching and we have to tell kids to be quiet and that's not fun. But um, you can laugh and holler and do whatever you want, talk to the fireflies all you want. They don't hear you, and it doesn't intimidate them a bit or inhibit their flight. We ask that the kids don't catch these fireflies because we want to leave them there for everybody else to see. Uh, This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Let's uh, get a caller in. So we say good morning to John, called in from Daphne, Alabama. Good morning, John. You're on the air with us. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Major and your uh, entomologist expert if there is an odor associated with termites. I have a closed room that often develops a kind of vinegary odor, and I wondered, you know, fearing what's going on, um, that it might be termites. Is there anything like that? I've asked other people, and nobody can tell me. Uh, I have not heard of any uh, aromatic compound that termites release that can be detected by humans. Um, That doesn't mean they don't do it. Uh, Dogs, of course, with their acute sense of smell, uh, have been trained to detect certain kinds of insects in materials that are being imported into the U.S. So we have... Uh, dog sniffers that can detect certain kinds of of insects. I suspect they might also be able to be trained to detect termites. That's very Uh, interesting. uh, But I don't know, I've not seen any records or reports of a compound that humans can detect. That's not to say that there's individuals that have an acute sense of smell that could detect something, but there's no evidence of it uh, that's been you know backed up with data all right thank you very much thanks yeah. john for your call this is creature comforts and it's time for the last break of the hour uh, but if you missed any part of today's show you can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app on your smartphone or you can download the mpb public media app then you have access to all of the local programs on mpb think radio back to wrap up the show in just a few minutes 
Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest today, Dr. Richard Brown. If you missed any of today's show, you can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. Got a couple of pet questions for Dr. Major, but first, uh, Dr. Brown, I remember as a little kid seeing the the exoskeletons, you know, attached to trees and everything. So uh, remind me, you said that that's, they'll shed that skin when they first emerge from the ground? Yes, and it's fascinating to watch it happen because when they, the that skin and these larval nymphal skins that you refer to, I used to play with them as a boy and make armies of them, you know, and then 4th of July I would pop a firework down and bomb them up, you know, that was <laughs> my, my fun. But they, when they come out, they'll split down the middle of their back and the area around the legs, the thorax, and then they will break through with their head and bend over backwards and on the abdomen is in, and they get so far, and then they bend back and grab their front legs onto the, the skin or the bark and pull the tail out, and then they're out. And then they leave that nymphal skin hanging on the tree trunk. Yeah, like I said, that's a, it's a vivid memory I have of, of a child. We lived in, uh, in Texas, so would, would I have been seeing them in Texas? Yes. Uh, we have 170 species of cicadas in the United States. And each state has different kinds. Uh, Texas has cicadas that we don't have, and we have some perhaps that don't occur in Texas. So, yes, you could get those. And, and interestingly, of the 170 species, each one has its own unique sound. Oh, wow. We had a researcher, a, a taxonomist of cicadas, visiting our museum. And he drove in. He says, by the way, he said, you've got a new state record of cicada, uh, Tibison Link and I, or whatever the name it was he used. And I said, how? Oh, do you have some? He says, no, I stopped and I heard it. <laughs> Could you imagine all 170 somehow uh, singing together? What a, what a cacophony that would be. Uh, got a couple of uh, pet questions for Dr. Major from email. This first one says, I have an older dog that seems to be leaking. She lies on the floor and a clear fluid leaks from somewhere in her posterior. It doesn't appear to be urine having the smell or coloration, but it isn't spring water either. Not a constant thing, just periodically, and no changes in her activities or personality. Any thoughts? Right. This sounds like an older dog. Is that correct? Uh Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's not unusual. When we uh, do an ovary hysterectomy or spay, uh, the ovaries are removed uh, along with the uterus. And when you remove the ovaries, you basically create a shortage of estrogen. And what happens is that the uh, tone of the bladder, uh, even though this doesn't smell like urine, uh, when they're laying down, females laying down, will have some leakage. And sometimes it can be quite a large amount. Need to see your veterinarian about that. Uh, usually it's not an infection, but there is some medication that can be given to actually help prevent this from happening. All right. Uh, this one says, we have an eight-month-old terrier mix puppy that we'd like to travel with. We've done some short trips, even to the vet, a quarter mile from the house, and he always seems to vomit. Is there anything you would suggest for us to do to help solve that problem? Well, they're doing the right things, taking short trips and, you know, the sort uh, going. But uh, I would suggest several things. One, uh, if you're taking a trip, don't feed the puppy, uh, but just a minimal amount before you go. And there are some medications that can be used. Uh, a veterinarian can have some that you can use. Uh, Dramamine and some, some dogs works quite well. Uh, but talk to your vet about that. Uh, I would suggest if you're taking a trip of any mileage, probably would be wise to medicate. All right. Uh, let's uh, go back to the phone lines. Kat has called in from Mobile. Kat, you're on the air with us. Go ahead, please. Hey, how are y'all doing this morning? Good. Um, I had a quick question about feral cats. We had a mother cat have several kittens in her backyard in the bushes. And I called Wildlife. Wildlife said call the police. The police department said call animal control. And we did that little do do for like, a few days, but nobody would help. 
um, because you can't train a feral cat, they say. So how would you suggest um, getting rid of them or, like, keeping them away from our backyard and from reproducing in our backyard? Okay. Well, this is a, a very good question. And one of the things, there are feral cat uh, uh, groups. Uh, I'm sure you're in Mobile. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. There should be uh, a group there. I don't know of it, but there should be a group that does uh, deal with feral cats. At the very least, uh, they should be captured and spayed and neutered so they won't continue to reproduce in large numbers. But search and see. There should be somebody in that area that can help you with the feral cats. And uh, I would continue to search, and hopefully you can find somebody that would help. All right, Kat, uh, thanks for your call. And I always want to have this disclaimer. Feral in a cat is spelled F-E-R-A-L, no relation. I do have a feral cat, but that's Bo, and he's at home. So just, uh, well, just he's, he's, no long, he's no longer a feral <laughs> cat. Well, he is a feral cat because it belongs to you, but he, he's not, not a, uh, let's say, a wild cat or wild uh, untrained. Right. And it is, a, it is a real problem, and we've talked about songbirds, depredation, uh, other things, and a lot of these cat colonies – Feral cat colonies will have disease such as upper respiratory and other contagious diseases, so it is an issue. Uh, last phone call of the hour goes to our friend Mikey in Mobile. Mikey, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Well, first of all, let me say that um, you are a feral human, right, Mr. Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, that might lead into my comment here. Um, I- I've had fun in the past, um, you know, doing some unusual stuff. And um, I- one year I uh, took the cicada shells and, um, uh, using some fishing line, attached them to some studs and made Halloween earrings out of them. <laughs> now, if you want to get- you can also you can also make like wonderful garden type ornaments out of them. I mean, if you really want to go crazy, take some top coating, you know, make them last longer, top coating clear fingernail polish, or take some colored stuff. Or they even make glow in the dark fingernail polish. Go crazy, <laughs> have fun, keep the kids busy for twenty minutes, right? <laughs> All right, Mikey. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the call. Uh, Dr. Brown, got a minute or so left. How would you recommend if someone is interested, maybe someone has a a child that's interested in in bug collecting and insects, what would be some tips to start an insect collection? Um, The the main thing is to get into contact with someone with extension who could refer you to someone else. We have an outreach program called Mississippi Bug Blues. You can find it on the Internet. Mississippi Bug Blues does uh, programs for young people and also can provide advice on where they can get the materials to or who they can contact to learn how to start collecting insects. And so uh, Mississippi Bug Blues All right. you can find, and, and that would be a good way to uh, get information and, and uh, other information. Uh, things that are necessary for starting to learn. Or they can contact me, and I can refer them. All right. Any parent can find me on the Internet through the Mississippi Entomological Museum. Very good. That's going to wrap things up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or previous show, you can go to mpbonline.org slash creaturecomforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Libby Hartfield, Dr. Troy Major, Claire Graves, and Richard Brown, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned because up next at 10, it's AutoCorrect with the lady auto mechanic, Allison Walker. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.